Alternative Dig Talk. Real Issues. Real Talk. Go to the church, Lou. Tell him, man, what's up? Man, can you imagine people just dump everywhere? Someone drinks water and throws the bottle wherever. Come on, Rogers. What else do you expect people to do with an empty bottle? Did you know that plastics take at least 450 years to decompose? What? That's a long time. Exactly. Because plastics are made out of a lightweight and flexible material that doesn't decompose easily. And plastics everywhere in the environment cause plastic pollution. What is plastic pollution now? It is the accumulation of plastic waste in the environment, like bottles, polythene bags, straws, all of these contribute to plastic pollution. I have been using them without knowing their effect. Yeah, a lot of people have. Plastics are a danger to the ecosystem, both on land and in water. So how can we overcome this problem? Is there something we can do? Oh yes, we can reduce by minimizing the use of plastics, reuse by repurposing them, or recycle by collecting and processing them into new products. Everyone wants to change the world, but no one wants to change themselves for the world. How about we change our habits for the world? And, and it, it starts, starts with, with me and you. you. This message is brought to you by Alternative Digitalk. The Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk. Ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good evening and a warm welcome to this edition of the Hotline Show. Uh, today is the 15th day of April 2024 and of course we are into uh, the halfway of this particular month, starting the second quarter of this particular year. My name is Edgar Matthew Karahanga and of course the Hotline Show returns with another exciting, knowledgeable uh, panel of really, really credible experts and gentlemen that you can say have done a little bit or a lot of uh, building for this particular country, Uganda. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Charles Kazova, who is the Executive Director for the Center for African Affairs and Diplomatic Studies. Uh, he's already here with me, and I have a Major Paula Awich. Uh, you already know him. He's the usual suspect here. He's always uh, right here with us. He is the, the Director for External Affairs at the National Resistance Movement, that is NRM, the ruling uh, government as we speak today. Of course, uh, we have none other than Mr. Ocheno Joseph, who is from the Uganda People's Congress, or UPC, the oldest political party, and a political party that is a very, very close at his heart. Uh, today, we are going to be mainly looking at what they call the extravagance of this particular government. The question first, is it actually extravagant in nature? Is it the people who are perceiving it as extravagant? Or the actual reality is it's extravagant? And if so, what are some of the working solutions? What can we do as Ugandans uh, to address this particular uh, challenge. Now, the extravagance is also coupled with the problem of the economy that we have today. Uh, today, as we speak, the taxes are too many. And, uh, of course, the prices of commodities and the price fluctuations in the market is also increasing by the day. And Ugandans are asking themselves, how can they su survive in such a dispensation and in such a time like this one? So. This is not just a political discussion. We are trying to look for solutions that we think will create something different, or an Africa that is different, starting from Uganda here. As I told you, my name is Edgar Matthew Karahanga. Please do send in some of your messages, uh, some of your comments. I'll be reading them subsequently as we continue with uh, the program. I can already see a couple of you who are already right here with us. Please send in those messages, and I'll be reading them. As we start with the show, allow me to welcome our guest for the day. The two gentlemen have been here, but I want the guest yeah. to first introduce himself. Say hi to our viewers, uh, Mr. Kaso Gazova Charles. You're welcome to the Hotline Show. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Karanga. Uh, I join um, uh, these two prominent gentlemen. I've shared with him a platform once, okay. uh, but not uh, with the major which from the ruling party. <laughs> the mighty NRM, of course, uh, for debate. Uh, I, my focus or my speciality is on uh, African issues, African uh, relations, how Africans relate with each other and how they relate with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my, my speciality. 
just a quick one. How does your organization really affect a Ugandan who's out there watching you? Because they may be asking themselves, what does the Center for African Affairs and Diplomatic Studies do? What exactly, how do you work with these Ugandans? Or how does your organization relate with the Ugandan out there? Let me give you one simple example. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a problem with uh, the Banyoranda community. Yes. Uh, the uh, major which is uh, side does not recognize some of them as citizens, even though they are born here. But we also know that uh, because of those issues, we have a very bad conflict in Eastern DRC. Yes. So to avoid uh, such conflict, our organization is uh, doing some work with, uh, of course, other stakeholders to find a lasting solution for such people. Yeah. Okay, I thank you so much, sir, Mr. Kazova. Uh, let me come to you, uh, Mr. Uh, Paula, which Major Paula, which do you want to just say hi to the people? It's been a while since you were here on the Hotline Show. How are you doing, sir? Oh, I'm doing well. Um, it's a, since a while since we have not been here, and I miss the viewers so much because we had already built a relationship. Mm -hmm. I've met some on the street who say they like to follow the program, which is good, find it educative and uh, sharing information and knowledge. Um, my specialty, as already my viewers know, I am an advocate of the High Court. I'm a practicing lawyer with mm -hmm. a practicing certificate. Mm -hmm. Although you may not see me so often in courts, and uh, that is for other engagement. Uh, I'm the Director of External Affairs of the party, and I ensure that uh, part matters that affect the parties outside Uganda uh, is done well. Uh, maybe I will talk later at some mm. stage, mm. I will leave it for now, where I instituted that the, my uh, people that which don't think uh, uh, mm. Banyarwanda are uh, Ugandans. Mm. You want me to clear it now? Please do. You see, uh, I could know it better than you, I, I bet, that uh, the third schedule in the Ugandan constitution mm. Mm. says list down indigenous communities mm. as by uh, first of uh, Feb in 1926. Mm. Yeah. Okay? Now, if you look at the indigenous communities, indigenous. they are arranged alphabetically. Banyarwanda is, I think, number 14. So, how dare me, a lawyer, not know Ugandans are national? I mean, this Banyarwanda are national when they are listed in the schedule of the constitution. Mm. During the CA debate, people started to put names to their communities. Bafumbira said because of the mountain, they'll be called Bafumbira, much as they are Banyarwanda in ethnicity. The Rwandese in Itungam, the Ruzindana, God Gasatura group, argued that for us we are Banyarwanda, we are not Banyankole, mm. and we have no geographical entity for identification. Therefore, they convinced CA to list themselves as Banyarwanda, and they're in the constitution. Mm -hmm. So we have Banyarwanda as listed in the third schedule of our constitution. The, the question yes. then would be, mm -hmm. the Banyarwanda are listed in the constitution of Uganda as part of Ugandan people, mm -hmm. but the practice that is um, often uh, meted on them is not really that that you may say is equal to other Ugandans. For example, many of these uh, Banyarwanda people have not been given passports and it's been on record because of that Banyarwanda question. So how do you address the practicality of them being Ugandans rather than the idea of them being in the constitution. It's okay, but I first wanted my friend to know that me as I which I know Ugandans, I know Banyarwanda as Uganda. Yes, that sir. was the first thing. Mm. So I didn't want any doubt to be put on me, a lawyer, a Uganda, not to know part of the indigenous. For example, it would be like me not knowing Kumam, who are part of Ugandans. Mm. How do I expect a Ugandan like a witch? not to know Kumam that they're going. In other words, I know all Ugandan communities as listed in the constitution, yeah. in the third schedule, mm -hmm. and Banyarwanda one of them. What maybe confuses people are Banyarwanda who are not part of this. They, they run, for example, the refugees of 1959. Yes. And people confuse, they think that when you are born in Uganda, then you are Uganda. No. The only way you can be citizenship by birth is if one of your parents is. Check the constitution. 
It's not like any two Kenyan who migrated to Uganda, settled in Lira, gives birth. That is a Uganda. No, that's not what the constitution provides. Okay. The, the constitution, yeah. you the constitution <laughs> provides that you must have one of your parents. Okay? In other words, if you're refugees mm. and you're born as refugees and you, your parents are both refugees, you continue to be that. It doesn't automatically grant you. Yeah, if it Uganda. does, somebody cite me a provision here. Mm. It is not. So, clarity should be made between Banyarwanda refugees of 1959, yes, okay, and Banyarwanda who come from Rwanda now. In any case, the Banyarwanda of Rwanda now, they don't even call themselves Banyarwanda. They call themselves Rwandans. Mm. They now don't call themselves Banyarwanda. Okay. They call themselves Mr. Kazawa, Rwandans. Please re react to him mm. in a minute so that we can move on and welcome Mr. Chen. You Chen know, here. before we started, uh, mm. Major, which said uh, UPC was a very progressive. Uh, by government. independence, mm. by far, compared to DP. And I realize compared to DP in, in respect to this matter. Mm. Now, when you look at the constitution, the independence constitution, it does not discriminate against Banyarwanda. Mm. Mm. It does not. Mm. Do you know, and has anybody asked himself why the 1995 constitution talks of 1926? Please tell us. There were targeted figures. Mm. And, and that is the anomaly we are trying to correct. Which because figures? The target for record purpose, mm -hmm. the target was uh, uh, Rujema and the other group. But, but, but that, that, that no, is no, more no. of... Um, That's a distortion. Why the 26 is, is like this? Why the 26 is because the final map of Uganda took shape. Remember Kisoro was brought from Rwanda. Yes. West Nile was brought from Congo. Okay. The other part, Uganda lost to Kenya. The part Amin wanted to take. So the 1926, that's don't speculate. The 1926 was in reference that, that's because the final map to because place. Now, yeah, now because in not, before, before 1926, just a minute, major, major, just, major, just a minute, major, just add mm. because, because because of your mistake, mm. which the, you, mis as a witch, the mistake okay. of the NRM government, mm. the population, the Banyarwanda, the Banyarwanda community in the rest of the country, with exception of Ntungamo and Chisoro mm. are affected by this policy. Okay, just a minute. Uh, to conclude on this then particular you issue. You push your voice Major, in the constituent assembly. To just conclude, there, to conclude this particular this issue, when you talk about um, there was a population census that was done prior to 1926, I think around 1910, they did not actually um, count the people who were living around Kavale, Chisoro areas because that was not mandated to be part of Uganda. So I think by 1926, the policy should have been the same that may have brought that particular issue. Yes. But le gentlemen, let's stop here and welcome Mr. Ocheno Joseph from the Uganda People's Congress. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. I'm actually quite saddened um, that we are now discussing this, but possibly not particularly surprised. Yeah. Um, I was recently coming from the north, actually from West Nile, and I stopped over at a supermarket, a petrol station actually. Yes, sir. And in my typical way, uh, engaging young people, I started engaging this young lady at the pump. It turns out that she's actually a victim of what you're raising. And th that's just the other week. I was quite shocked. Um, on the basis of, who, of her narration, both parents and I think grandparents uh, from both sides were born in Uganda. I don't know the details. Something that I actually wanted to raise with a particular lawyer friend of mine and an activist. And it's something that I wanted to build a case on and then raise with the, with the, with the Ministry of Inter Internal Affairs. Because of the third time I was hearing it. So this girl's uh, story was um, very sad. It really touched me. And uh, she was quite emotional about it. Uh, looking at this young, beautiful girl, and she genuinely looked in crisis. Now, the irony is this that considering the thankfully very progressive UPC policies uh, and, and, uh, that uh, makes Uganda the best host of refugees mm. on the continent and that my brother gladly, kindly, generously grants to us, which is rarely given to us, um, uh, that this is the foundations that we built. Mm. And the considering the irony that the Banyarwanda question in part contributed to Museveni's rather atrocious war in Luero, <laughs> and use the Banyarwanda community and actually people from Rwandese descent 
and in a way without prejudice, a section of Westerners, particularly Bahima, to basically launch this thing uh, against uh, a UPC government and basically while building Museveni. It's quite sad that then this matter being entrenched in the 1995 constitution, which many of us were opposed. For me, I, many of us were opposing this thing, simply saying that, look, I, I'm a Ugandan refugee in the UK, but I'm not demanding uh, for uh, my Ugandanness to be defined as a tribe somewhere in the corner of uh, Britain. Uh, um, and then we had the Kenyans, like now we had the Ugandans, who've been refugees in uh, Tanzania since 1971. Mm. We've had um, the Ugandans who continue to suffer, both, mm. and I'm saying so, both in, in, particularly in, in Zambia, since 1985, mm. who went there as refugees. And by the way, there were some very horror stories mm. of, of Ugandans uh, living in Southern Africa, but particularly in Zambia, where their laws you have to respect uh, was such that you, these, these guys could not get access to certain very basic services, let alone certain basic jobs. Um, brings me back to the question here in Uganda, that how is it and what was really the purpose? And I'll be interested to hear from you, my brother. Uh, and I know we may be um, uh, deviating from the primary topic, but I think it's a, so an, it's a matter important, important enough yes. uh, for us to, to have some, 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 some more time on. Mm -hmm. What is it that has actually led us into this? Um, because I think it's both hypocritical, particularly considering that the progressive, mighty, progressive, Pan-Africanist Uganda People's Congress founded these things. Part of Milton Obote's argument as then leader of the Ugandan opposition in 1959, uh, when Banyarwanda were actually um, um, running into Uganda for, following the, the then genocide there, uh, the British were reluctant uh, to accept uh, the Banyarwanda in Uganda, apparently, as typical British who were ruling Uganda at the time. And Obote said, apparently, no. These are African brothers. Of course, those days they used more of the word brothers than brothers and sisters. These are African brothers. You know, <laughs> they must be allowed in. So him, he was not only the leader of the the, the, the then largest opposition party, which was almost certainly going to be leading. Mm. But of course, no, it was not. Known. But he was the most influential voice, yeah. actually, very articulate voice yeah. in the legislative assembly. And of course, the British were now very much on the defensive. And uh, beginning to talk African nationalism and say these are African brothers and you're stopping them. Maybe it's the more reason why we should chase you out of Uganda Just very quickly. Just for clarity, you're yeah. talking about the 1949 revolution. Precisely. You said genocide, so maybe someone may think it's 94, but you're referring to the 1959. Well, but there was there was genocide, you know, and the, the law he will correct me on that. Genocide. But we can call it well, you know, we can call it 1959 revolution, yeah. and you quite hard to think in a way. But um, so um, we guaranteed the arrival of the Banyarwanda refugees in Uganda, the settlement of the Banyarwanda refugees in Uganda, and the guaranteeing of the total <laughs> universality of their basic rights. Some of the rights that um, you can only enjoy in many of the few developed countries, some of which uh, 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 you can't really find anywhere else in Africa. The Banyarwanda did that. Now, one of the reasons why sometimes I actually felt quite resentful, and I'll say it here today, uh, about a section of Banyarwanda, I've told some of my Banyarwanda colleagues mm. in this, that look, you know, we did all these other things for you. You know, then come 1980, you know, and then you turn against us, and then you go ahead and even <laughs> go ahead and say, oh, you are you're beating us and returning to Rwanda because we chased you because of hostility. But now it's interesting, ironic, it's a bit of a long story. <sighs> the Banyarwanda now can go ahead and say, we told you, we ran away from Uganda <laughs> because they're mistreating us, you know. Which so, is a different thing. But, please, in just yeah, a minute as we yeah, conclude, sorry. why do you think it's now so prevalent at a time such as this one? I actually don't know. I don't know whether, you know, it's about, and I've, and I've asked this, this is an important conversation, and I was interested in having this, and I'm still interested in having it with some of my lawyer colleagues, some of my Banyarwanda friends in, 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 you know, who, who are actively engaged, and possibly activists, like my brother here. Is it because of the Museveni Kagame? personal relationship thing? Is it because of uh, part of it still paying the price as part of the Kisangani thing in mm. Congo where things went right? Is it their voice about Museveni and Kagame? Is it about this power thing? But is it also about the suspicion uh, that has been on the national uh, uh, tables uh, that um, Museveni supports um, uh, Rwandese uh, opponents of Kagame using the word distance and vice versa? Is it out of that mutual trust? Distrust. When I asked very quickly, mm. I was shocked by how robust uh, Comrade Witch apparently, you know, you, you know, you, 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 it might interest you, that apparently they, they really accuse the people at immigration, you know, yeah. of being very, very harsh. Yes. And now, the, the identity prejudice, that's why this is an important topic, 
if you go out there, the perception is that at immigration, a predominantly NRM leaning, supporting public servant, some of whom are almost certainly almost towards uh, without particular identities. That the broader Ugandan might think that, no, these might be people who might be sympathetic by the Rwanda. You mm. see. Okay. <coughs> Allow me, Excuse me. Just, I, Mr. Kola, which I want to just respond to this. Uh, I want him to submit as well so that you can yeah. respond at once. Mm. Uh, Mr. Kazova, I, I want to start from the question I've asked this gentleman. Why is it that the, the Banyarwanda question has been so prevalent in the recent times? It's not something that you used to see in the past often mentioned, but right now, the Banyarwanda question needs to be as answered as soon as it can. Why? Why it's such a we, we used never to have national identity cards mm -hmm. to access mm -hmm. uh, services. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. uh, today, you need an ID to even go to hospital, even to university, <coughs> even to nursery. You need a uh, national ID. Uh, you need, uh, if you need a job, like in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. Dubai, you need a passport, passport. but it has to ha correspond to, with the details mm -hmm. on the national ID. Yes. Now, these people who are Ugandans can't have the things. Those who have had them mm -hmm. have been confiscated from them. Oh, seriously? So thousands, their national IDs have been confiscated from them. Mm. Their passports have been confiscated from them. Now, you have a section of Ugandans who have become stateless because of an erroneous government policy. They are not Rwandans from that side. Mm. And here we are saying they are not Ugandans. Mm. So where are they? And this is the trouble we have. You, you keep marginalizing a particular community, you create a huge problem for yourself. He has said that uh, those that came in after 1926 were largely refugees. But I, I thought that's what, oh, I'm sorry if that's what I, I understood. But we should also understand that there are so many, Banyarwanda started coming to Uganda way, way, way before 1900. Yes, that's true. So even before the formation of the country called Uganda, the state called Uganda, Banyarwanda were already part of Uganda. Mm -hmm. So they deserve to be citizens. Mm -hmm. Now, the day you begin discriminating against them, you create trouble. Okay. The only two communities, the Banyarwanda that are legally recognized mm -hmm. by the 1995 constitution, are that group in Ntungamo mm -hmm. and the one of Chisoro. Mm -hmm. Chisoro, of course, because of the border. You understand? Now, you have Banyarwanda, a huge chunk of Banyarwanda, mm -hmm. who are in eastern Uganda, central Uganda, some even in uh, districts of western Uganda, yes. and northern Uganda, that cannot be recognized as Ugandan citizens. They are recognized as Ugandan citizens, that's the thing. It's just maybe the people who are in those offices that are trying to play No. Politics. By the way, we've the interacted with the people at the immigration mm -hmm. uh, uh, department. Mm -hmm. They are following the law to the letter, as it is stated. That's, that's what they are implementing. Oh. In fact, their suggestion is, go back to parliament, amend the constitution, mm -hmm. so that these people can be recognized as citizens. If not, the, and, and you, you, largely you can't blame the So then are you talking department. about constitution anomaly rather than... Yeah, it is a constitution so anomaly. So maybe it's unfair to suggest, without, sorry, to suggest that the NRM guys are doing it, mm. when in effect the NRM obviously bungled it in their own constitution because their constitution by doing it. And so therefore part of the campaign should be that well. And like UPC, we told you so, there's an NRM crooked constitution. We should go back basically. Uh, you, uh, you raise a very, a very pertinent issue. Mm -hmm. It is political. Mm -hmm. It's the politics between the two countries. Yeah, okay. 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 Let's okay. bring in Major no. uh, <laughs> well, I get you. Uh, first of all, let's be clear about body effect. For your information, or for the viewers, the only indigenous communities or big indigenous communities that does not spill outside the Uganda border is only one. Which Unfortunately, one? it is mine, the Langis. <laughs> He's boasting. It is the Langis. <laughs> they are Chulis, yeah, they are Chulis, they are bigger Chulis in Sudan yes, than yes, Uganda. That's true. Mm -hmm. Karamojong go to Kenya. Yeah. Tesu, the king more and more, has territory up to Kenya. Agri Awori, the brother was a vice president there, Awori was here. 
banyankola in karagwe bachiga in kitang in rwanda mm. um whatever bafumbira there because since people are in Congo, mm. Congo. Mm. even the uh, uh, Kanungu people, others are in Congo, everywhere, Baganda in Tanzania, mm. the only community that does not spill out is the mm. Langis. Okay. And that is why it shapes a bit of our traits. We tend to argue, we tend to solve it here. Taking a gun is, unless you're in Tanzania, like a little joke, mm. but within here, you're very careful because you have nowhere as a fallback. <laughs> from this therefore, from this therefore, it is just prudent that it is easy to notice. Like there are chulis in Sudan, mm. they are youth, Banyarwanda, who were cut by a border. Just like the angry worry, the brother was cut that side, cut this. So this Banyarwanda cut in Tungam, they are cut in a, a Kisol. Mm. And that is where the Ruzindana knows no any other band in Rwanda, maybe great great grandfather or something. But Ruzindana is a Uganda. So that is what we are talking about. So these people chose to be called Banyarwanda, but in Uganda. Yes. The it's other true. thing that I want to comment yeah. about briefly is internal affairs. You know, in internal affairs, the way they arranged it in that is that uh, every community has a desk, like Lango. Yeah. If you fill the passport and they said you are Langi, mm. There is a desk officer who are trained mm. to interrogate you. Yes. Who is your grandfather? Mm. Which village is he in? Mm. So the, the victims who are Banyarwanda, who are now there, are people who cannot, by the desk officer, be traced as to their originality. That's true, yeah. You will also agree with me. I have met some who are my friends. There are many Banyarwanda friends who come. And when you ask them, mm. they identify as Banyoro. Then the other person who are asking said, okay, maybe go to the Banyoro desk. And the Banyoro desk wouldn't identify such a person. So it is also true, if they are victims of Banyarwanda, who do not fall by the letter, it says, in the indigenous community, then those Banyarwanda who don't fall in the indigenous community, majority are actually from across because it is not easy to go to for labor mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia or in, in, a, in Middle East from Rwanda since the government policy is not and so much different. Open. Mm -hmm. So many find themselves victims. So in a Mnyarwanda, who is going to a Mnyarwanda desk in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs should identify. Like they said, like if you say you are an Acholi, there is an Acholi desk, he will ask you which clan, which village, who is your grandfather? So those questions. Now, if there is a, a, a lack of satisfaction by these officers in Ministry of Foreign, mean Internal Affairs, then we need to revisit. But the Constitution says you must belong to an indigenous community, as by 1926. If you came uh, in nine, before in 1925, for example, were you in an indigenous community? The Indians tried. Hmm. The Indians tried to argue that we Indians were also in Uganda by, 20, by this time. Hmm. The question is, were you an indigenous community? Hmm. So Indians failed to qualify as well. Hmm. So, indigenous means hmm. someone who's born in yes, that country. Yes, the communities who were country. there, they are known hmm. and they are listed. Okay, sir. okay? Hmm. so uh, the Indians also tried to argue. I know of a, a, a daughter of a colonel who is my friend, a lawyer, who was taking up the Indian case. Because the Indian were saying, if it is by indigenous, uh, if by 1926, uh, we were already there building Uganda railways. But the question is, where you an indigenous community here? Mm. So, uh, all this. So, where do you want this young person, 16 years of age, they've been born in 2004, 2005, their grandfather was here, their great grandfather is here, their parents are here. How do you tell that person that they are not in Ugandan? Because Let me also by the law, years. but there is a window for them. There is a, there is a acquired citizenship. There is a way those people can apply mm. to be citizen if they so wish. So they can still exhaust that window, a window of citizenship where you make an application to state, I was born here, my parents lived here, I have no criminal record, and therefore... Much as I'm not a Ugandan, I'm applying to be a Ugandan. Major problem. Uh, 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 let me ask you minutes, uh, just one question. Mm -hmm. When did Uganda become Uganda? Legally? It's debatable, but you can take from the, the, the British protectorate, 
if you take it from the British protectorate. Exactly. But as I'm saying, the 1926 came about because it kept on being added and deleted. And you see, that, that, kept has, been, added and that has been our okay? argument. Okay. The, yeah. These guys in UPC, yeah. we are very smart. Yeah. They said, as by Independence Day, if you were in Uganda, you're Ugandan. Mm -hmm. Simple, period. Okay. Now, you, you don't stretch yourself to 1926, so, Julie, what Uganda legally became Uganda in 1962. So any stranger okay. who was in Uganda uh, would qualify. Let's conclude this particular issue. <laughs> you want any stranger, whether he's in, <laughs> let's conclude this he's in Malawi and um, at that time to be Uganda. I, I have a lady who's watching That us. would be interesting her, her to put it in CF. You know, put it in CF. Nacha Inerita says, the challenge now is that even our brothers and sisters in brackets, Banyarwanda, have in some cases threatened Ugandans according to how they execute their cause <laughs> of now they were Van Dimwe. So it feels like the people are fearing the Van Dimwe. But gentlemen, allow me just to stop here. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the taxation. Uh, we have a, another tax problem or a problem that Ugandans think is a problem that is the over taxation, double taxation and the exploitive taxes. And I'm going to start with you, Mr. Cheno. It's the tax <laughs> Let me start with you, sir. Sure. <laughs> because... Um, you're from the mighty UPC, so you call it. Sure. Uh, sir, do the 